tonight, that reminds me of a story about the Blues Brothers who told a joke at one of their concerts. And they asked the audience, they said, do you know what a wish sandwich is? W-I-S-H, sandwich. And the audience looked at them in sort of confusion. And they said, well, a wish sandwich is you take two slices of bread and you wish you had the meat. Well, tonight, we have the meat, our panels. And let's wish that Dale makes the sandwiches. No pressure. I'm very pleased to introduce Dale Minkowski, a good friend, a very fine artist, a graduate of Grand Central uh, Atelier with Jacob Collins, and a fine instructor there. And so with no further introduction, it's a pleasure to be here. That's a uh, hard act to follow up here. Uh, can everybody hear me? Is it yeah. loud? Okay. Um, delighted to be here tonight. Uh, it was a hard yes, but uh, Alex stopped me to do it, and uh, I'm honored to sit here and uh, moderate this uh, panel with these extremely talented artists. Uh, um, I want to give a huge thank you to Rob Pillsbury, President, uh, Tim Newton, Chairman, I know he flew in from parts of over there, uh, Vine Styler, and uh, Chris Nunley, who have uh, helped us with a ton of emails and a lot of logistics setting this um, stage up here. Uh, as you can see, it's a little bit different than a normal or a usual uh, kind of panel discussion. Um, and I'll thank Alex Kaplan uh, for getting this crew to meet uh, together. Um, <laughs> probably like herding cats. But, um, and the Salma Gummy Club for letting us use the venue, beautiful building, community uh, brownstone, have this kind of discussion. Um, it's, uh, it's pretty special uh, in a great city. So, and I thought I saw Peter Tripi somewhere. That's right. Uh, uh, legend uh, in moderating the world. So I do half the job. Uh, you do uh, uh, you do the job. Let's give a hand to Peter. Uh, and I give you a quick rundown of how we're going to do it tonight. Uh, the panelists are going to have uh, about an hour to discuss our topic. Um, and then we're going to open the last 30 minutes up to uh, audience questions. So if you can hold those until the end, that would be great. If you really need to like work something out, go for it. Um, <laughs> but let's try hold it until the end uh, if you can. Uh, the goal for this, we kind of spoke together, uh, all the panelists, and kind of the goal that I thought of, my vision for this was to almost invite you into kind of a living room of sorts, uh, or where we're just kind of hanging out, having dinner, or having cocktails, uh, or all the above, and having a conversation. Um, inviting you into this conversation was um, what, what I had in mind, rather than just this kind of Q&A and um, uh, a traditional panel. So um, the conversation tonight about a word that gets kind of uh, thrown around a lot in uh, representational painting. Um, a word that I've been hearing uh, since undergrad, probably a hundred years ago, and a word that uh, I don't even know if I know the exact meaning of uh, anymore, as it seems to get muddled uh, these days uh, with the passing decade. That word, you guys might know it, uh, real the big one. Um, and the idea tonight, as Alex said, is to, uh, to get down to the art of matter and touch on realism. And we're going to kind of break it into three parts, past, present, and future. Um, so we'll spend about 20 minutes on each give or take, and uh, and then we'll move on from there. Uh, but you didn't come here for me to ramble on. I wanted to just introduce the panelists and uh, give you a quick bio here. So um, we've got to my left here, Stephen Bauman. Um, Stephen works on the figure. And uh, after a decade of study in Eastern Europe, he returned to the U.S. Uh, and just the one of the first ones up at the Farms Capital Art uh, in Jersey City. And he's currently the director of the Anatomy and FSA program as well as continuing to teach drawing and painting uh, in the core program. He's been exhibited widely uh, in the US, uh, Europe, and 
Asia. Uh, and so here's the left, we've got Jacob, Jacob Collins. Uh, he's got a leading figure in contemporary revival of classical painting. He earned a BA in history from Columbia College, attended the New York Theater School, the New York Academy of Art, and the Art Students League. Uh, as a student, he also copied extensively in museums in America and Europe. He's worked in widely visited North America and Europe and is included in several American museums. Uh, Counter Water Street Atelier, the Grand Central uh, Atelier, and the Hudson River Fellowship. And then across the pond here, we've got Patricia Lockwood. Um, she's a A uh, figure painter based in New York, she's an MFA from New York Academy of Art and studied at their Water Street Atelier. Her work has been exhibited at the Beijing World Art Museum, the Buffalo Museum, New Britain Museum of American Art, and she had a solo museum exhibit at, exhibit at the St. Louis University Museum of Art, and at Ford Gallery in New York City. Her commission portraits hang in institutions uh, such as St. Louis City Hall, Kennedy School of Government, and Harvard University. She's produced instructional DVD on portraiture with Stream on Art Video and is a featured art instructor with Blueprint. Her next solo show, we have nothing going on, is uh, at Gas State Gallery uh, on May 2nd uh, in the city here. So don't, don't miss that. And then coming from far away, uh, Ohio. So he wins the award. We've got Anthony National Mateo. And of arts degree in art history from Princeton uh, University in 1992. She led to a five-year position at Christie's Auction House in New York City in the American paintings, 19th century paintings, and maritime paintings and objects departments. He began studying the practice of art at the Art Students League in New York City, and in 1997 he transitioned to full-time art study at the Water Street Atelier. Uh, under the tutelage of Jacob Collins. He has worked solely as a professional artist since 2002. He currently has representation galleries in New York, uh, Los Angeles, and Cleveland, and he currently resides in Akron, Ohio. Akron, sorry, Akron, no be, sorry, Ohio. Um, so uh, let's have another hand for our panelists here. And now I get to get a little more comfortable. Um, so, I was, and everybody can still hear me uh, in the back? Tim, we're good? Okay. Um, so I was having a conversation uh, about this topic, realism, and someone asked me what the definition was. I didn't have anything to say. <laughs> I didn't know what the definition was. So I went to what most people my age do. Uh, I went to the old Wikipedia. Uh, and I pulled up uh, Wikipedia's definition of realism, and I'm going to read this. It's a little paragraph. It's got uh, some SAT words in it, so I'll do my best here. Um, realism, sometimes called naturalism in the arts, is generally the attempt to represent subject matter truthfully without artificiality and avoiding artistic conventions or implausible, exotic, and supernatural elements. Realism has been prevalent in the arts at many periods, and can be in large part a matter of technique and training, and the avoidance of stylization. In the visual arts, illusionistic realism is the accurate de depiction of life forms, perspective, and the details of light and color. But realist or naturalist works of any art may, as well or instead of illusionist realism, be realist, quotes, in their subject matter, and emphasize the mundane, ugly, or sordid. This is typical of the 19th century realist movement that began in France in the 1850s after the 1848 revolution. The realist painters rejected romanticism, which had come to dominate French literature and art with roots in the late 18th century. That's a lot. Um, so I wanted to kind of turn this over to you guys now and give a, get a little reaction to what, um, what I just read, but also if you can think of how far back does realism actually go? And can you think of an artist that maybe comes to your mind, maybe pre-1850s or older, um, before this term realism actually uh, came about? Anthony? So, yeah, <clears throat> excuse me. I don't really know if I can, you know, give a beginning date, but I know that in thinking about realism for me, where I actually connect with it is kind of Northern Renaissance realism, right? The kind of realism, because I think for me there, 
there's a panoply of possibilities within what realism is, like you, you described there. And for me, where I actually connect with it is the Northern Renaissance, you know, uh, Jan van Eyck, Gerard David, even the German, like Albrecht Dürer, where the focus for me is on an attention to particularity, right? So that, that, that what you're painting is particularly this thing as opposed to a generalization, an idea, or an idealization of a thing. So for me, that's kind of the center of realism, and I kind of get on that highway at, at that time um, and, and in that historical movement. Mm -hmm. Steve, you have I, I feel like I didn't prepare for Tony stealing my answer. But the, uh, <laughs> no, the, the reality of the situation is like uh, on the day to day um, throughout my education in, in my sort of artistic practice, uh, you know, when I visit museums and I, I look at, at what we're calling realist work, um, the dividing line um, does settle somewhere in between, like forgetting about idealization and showing an artist, particular, uh, showing through their work their care and attention to the particular. Um, you know, and in this way, like I kind of, um, this is the attachment that I find to, to realism as opposed to say like romanticism or, or, you know, uh, whatever we associate with like classical academic work, right, to, to be, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that, that doesn't sort of grab me is that it, it does not seem to, um, attach very much to, uh, uh, the particular thing that that artist cared about in that, in that subject, um, which is in a way how I'm able to appreciate, uh, um, I, I thought of this the other day, um, just looking at uh, Fatin Latour's paintings, right? And um, however unpopular it might sound, I, I don't actually really care for flowers um, that much. But I care for Fatin Latour's flowers because I can sense in his work how much he cared for them. Um, and if we travel far back enough uh, in artistic practices, I, I feel like I don't get as much that sense in certain periods of work. Um, and then, yeah, around the 1800s, I would say, mid-1800s, you start to see that that feeling coming into representation. So, was Jake was the eighteen mid eighteen hundreds? Was that when? Do you think that's when realism was? You know, Courbet or whoever. I don't want to put any people in your mouth, but is that when it? Is that what you think of when you think of realism? Um, I, I I do because it's what it means. It's when the word came about, so it means that that was a very very good little couple sentences from Wikipedia. Thank you. I was very impressed with that. It was so kind of broad and encompassing. Um, but I, I was particularly, uh, I, the, the Tony's point about the, the, the particularity of the thing and not the, the genera was, was quite striking. Um, and, but it, I think about things pop in my head, like the way the sort of diaphanous cloth, the marble cloth on a Hellenistic figures, it's like, yes, the Hellenistic figures are classicized as overall works of art, but that thing, that like particular, the specificity of the way we know, it's like the, but also the magic of transforming your art materials into the real, because it's not, it's not, I mean, there's real, we all know about real, but realism, it's a kind of a magical thing. And so, little bit there's so i feel like that the art tradition that goes back to fifth century greece and certainly the fifth century sculptures i guess that's somehow the beginning although you see in not in their entirety in egyptian sculptures obviously they're so stylized in 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 their overall uh how they present that you wouldn't say they're realist in that way but little bits are like sometimes the way the nostril moves into the into the passage into the cheek it's so it it has that what i consider that magical quality of an artist who looked at the world and was overwhelmed by the wonder of the world and then enchanted by his power or her power to make these inert materials like the world that i think for me as a child i had that we all had that which is that what an amazing thing and and to to make inert things like the world and i guess that's the that's the realist impulse which is different from realism as an art movement but it sort of flowers so strongly in in uh tony in the 1400s in flanders and germany 
but you find it, you know, it manifests in these little spots all around. And I think those of us for whom it's a powerful, um, uh, in, for, for who we need to pursue it, we know what, we, I feel like I know that feeling. I see it in other people. Patty, can we do word association? Can I go back, Patricia, Patty? Patricia. Patty is good. If I say realism, you say. <laughs> Give me a name. Blue. <laughs> is there someone you think nailed it? Is there someone you think of? I, I mean, think I go to the Met and I see Juan de Pareja, right? And right. Like, that's I think it. For me, Velasquez, that's it, right? right? That's I mean, kind of like a go-to for like the beginning of like from from the Renaissance forward is sort of the person who, pers I think you know, visually, per pictorially personifies that sense of like a rejection of the ideal as something that's particularly interesting and a deep affection and representation of the specific and and that it's it's the elevation of the specific that become then then we all relate to because of the deep humanity of it um, another example would be like Rembrandt's Bathsheba where that um, nude is so deeply human and her hands and her feet are so very much like real human feet and not like you know an idealization like Beaux-Arts ideal of feet and it's um, like Rembrandt's like affection for that that human being that posed then like translates to the affection that you sense in the narrative of the painting and then the way that you respond to it. Um, and it's interesting, this, this, this like it's a spectrum between, um, yeah, idealization and conceptualization because even in Egypt, like Jacob was saying, like there are even examples of like incredibly naturalistic like fate, uh, sculptures of heads that you just feel like, wow, like I can actually see this. I have a sense of the feeling of this individual person from 5,000 years ago um, that has a, I think a, a tremendous, like, I think we are all drawn to that. I think, you know, we're all now representational and realist painters. So that, that uh, the power of that as a, it's like it's a spectrum between sort of idealization as opposed to like naturalism and the individual specificity of, of, um, of lived human experience. So why did realism get its name? Why, who, why did they do this thing? If they were all painting these things, so I go back to Titian, he was doing it. Velasquez is doing it. We can go back further, Greeks and all these things. Then all of a sudden it has a name. Was it political? Did it need a name? Was it, what was, what was, why? I don't know if I'm incorrect about this, but wasn't it like kind of a social movement actually? Like it was, and in, it's an inception, like realism was kind of like a social idea to show not uh, Madonnas and children, et cetera, but to show like uh, workers and people in the fields and uh, um, Zola? Tony Emil would know. Zola? Yeah, it's Emma Zola. But the thing is, my wife teaches AP Spanish, right? And she's reading La Feria de Tormes, right? 1552. And that's a, a, a novel, 50 pages, right? That's written. And that's a realism that's happening well before we're talking about the real life of an underclass 18 year or an eight year old boy who's struggling in Spain. And so I think it's happening in these different places at different times well before it's named. Sure. Right. And I think it's happening in real ways. And I think one of the reasons why Spanish painting resonates is that that's part of the kind of cultural phenomenon that's actually happening in Spain and that France through kind of Napoleonic conquest and what happens kind of goes down and borrows a lot of that sensibility and brings it up and 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 buffers the Louvre and you know it, it, and then develops a sensibility that eventually becomes adopted as this French thing right this French realism but so I think it's a it's a problematic term because it's happening in different places in very real ways which might not have been considered as significant right because it's a lot of it's who's telling that story. So I'm, I'm coming through it through, you know, reading some of these, like the picaresque novels, right? Where that, that's why, you know, we had, in an email exchange, we had sent these emails. And it's happening exactly what you're talking about, the people in the fields, right? This eight-year-old boy who's surviving on the streets of Toledo, 
for bread and whatever with the priests and the, but that's happening 300 years before exactly what you're describing where you have you know the gleaners or you have all this stuff so that's why it becomes a problematic term when you tell the story that way but i guess that, that to me that speaks to the there's this in, in there's this tremendous human desire to describe things and even you know i don't i'm not a very broad reader but you think about like there's always little little bits of realism that's just like that's something that people can't help they can't help but do it and uh, we remember it so vividly so but when this thing happens as Dale's asking about that be, that gets a name it's it is political it is it, it's the political and it relates to 19th century politics, the rejection of, of idealism, which was associated with, I, I don't know what, uh, you know, hierarchical uh, uh, class structure. Institutions, isn't it? Yeah. Right, so, so what would you say, though, it, with, like, let's say, Velazquez, right? And the triumph of Bacchus, right? That's happening well before, and that's literally the statement of a rejection of idealism, right? You have this idealized God and then you have these ruddy-faced peasant drunkards who are smiling, you know, with these kind of garish smiles and whatever. So I think to me it was actually addressed in like very direct or even the spinners, right? Velasquez addresses it in the spinners. He puts the, the mythological scene in the back, but in the front, in the foreground, you have the women who are spinning the yarn, right? So that, that's why I, I, I just, to me, I wonder about the narrative and its association with the French history of it. And I also think that it's, that the French borrowed it through force from other places. Well, not to be terribly cynical about the thing, but of course the French, you know, late 19th century was also like, that's where the art gallery was basically event invented, right? And sort of an art market and the, the commodification of a product of an output of an artist and the, de you know, definition of styles. Of course, it always happened before that as well. But I think we could probably credit the French for good marketing, for like defining realism as a style. And these artists work in this style. And this, you should be very interested in the latest realist painting coming out of, you know, 1860s ateliers, you know. So, and so not to be cynical, but I think that the French were very good at that. It was, yeah. yeah. I think philosophically, though, it wasn't just rebelling against sort of classicism and idealism. I think it was rebelling against the idea of um, even just a, a shift of um, phil philosophy against uh, about like a rejection of the idea of, frankly, the soul or like God is the center of the universe, like that, that, that man exists in this sort of spiritual universe where everything is ordered and that that be artistic, it's like the beginning of secularism in, in art and a, and a huge philosophical shift about, about um, how, uh, how we as individuals are related to other people and to the universe at large. I mean, this was one shift taking place in a world of like major shifts, like the, the, the world was, was generally changing in, in the way that people thought about and reflected on it. Um, and I think it's reflected then in literature and art. I think those are like the the symptoms of of a change rather than like uh, uh, changes in themselves. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Right. And it, the French Revolution was 1848. So the reaction is to the French Revolution when in, the realism is being introduced as a reaction to the revolution. Isn't that isn't that part of it? The political reaction to a political event. Mm -hmm. Sure. It's almost though what I would wonder about is I think about like we're saying that there's all this realism, but I don't know. You feel like you see we're talking about Velasquez, or I think about those little like Luna paintings and earlier. It's like there's there's little this thing asserts itself. It just always asserts itself. 
Mm-hmm. You you know you get in sometimes. I remember I don't know even know who it was looking at some. 14th century or 13th century manuscript illustrators little sort of drawings that were they were so realistic and then obviously because the client wanted stylized more what we think of as medieval drawings then they learned I remember looking at them juxtaposed to the final product and so then the the work in the manuscript was more what we think of as medieval and stylized but I remember being struck by the fact that this artist had they couldn't help themselves they wanted to describe the world and the flavor and have have it have its flavor and so um it feels to me like this we're talking about so many things there's the political element um but then there's also this this thing i was talking about before this desire to describe the world and have the, the flavor of the essence of the world so you're saying though sometimes that uh, you're looking at art in in particular periods where this is seeping in, it, un, you know, without without the approval. It's right. not, it's not it the comes in from and the then edges. This moment where then it becomes the right. The, 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 but there's other the moments. Main. You certainly see in the yeah. in the Baroque. You certainly like Ribera. Yeah. There's just oh, this sorry. tremendous. I mean, yeah. it, it's so realism can have a kind of a flimsy quality sometimes because mm. it feels unsupported by the structure of the art itself because it's so beholden to the world mm. and then with Rivera it, it it's not I mean Rivera is so stunningly mm. powerful mm. but it's so realistic yeah. and in yeah. realistic in all of the ways like even like the realist I mean he was somebody that the 19th century Frenchmen were looking at mm. uh, to try to they were astonished by mm. But I don't know. I sort of feel like I think that's a good, that's an interesting point about the po- politics of hijacking something that existed not only mm. in Spain, but but uh, it was also because perhaps of the excess of the strangeness of uh, early nineteen or early to mid nineteenth century French uh, classicism has so is so peculiar looking that then the, the pendulum had swung maybe a little far mm-hmm. in that way. Yeah, sure. So then people were thirsty for. Uh, a less mannered mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, style. Mm. Yeah. So, for example, one of the things I learned, and one of my particular interests in art history, was that in the you know the fourteen early fourteen hundreds, you have particularity arise in Northern Renaissance art because you have this notion and this theology that, and you don't have to believe this, but let's presume right that God came into the world right. So instantly, reality takes on a different character, right? If you believe that God was incarnate, and I'm not saying you have to, you should, you whatever, but that's what they were believing at the time. Your relationship as an artist to the particularity of created matter, its representation all the way down to all of its details, right? It all begins to matter, right? Because God said it mattered. So when you move from book illumination which had an illustration that was accompanied by a text to describe it right and you move into panel painting which now the image itself has to describe the entire universe and that entire universe is filled with infinite particularity right all of that particularity matters because your mindset is that god himself said that it matters and so then you get Flemish painting in the 1450s, painting every flower and every detail and every, because they're having to tell the story. And you, you notice in those paintings, a lot of the characters, they're not wearing, you know, time period garb from when these events were happening. They're wearing Flemish garb. And why are they doing that? Because this reality. Well, they, they sort of are, but they also are wearing weird outfits that probably nobody ever wore. Yeah, it's, I yeah. mean, a lot of it is like made up. Yeah. But I just wanted to come back to there's something fascinating about the fact that we're, and I agree with both, we're accepting like, you know, the extremely visual, like Velasquez, the spinners, uh, it's so kind of optical field immaterial as realism which we all feel that it is. And then you're this interest in, you know, a 1450s Flemish painting as realism, which doesn't have any of that, but it, it has this other thing. 
So you don't find the, the you know, uh, granular materiality of northern painting in the Velasquez or in the Ribera, maybe a little bit in the Ribera, and you don't find that sort of visual breadth realism in the northern painting, but we are, we are, I mean, it's like a different, the same word means these different things, and we accept them both because it applies to both, but it's different. I don't know what that, where, where we are. I think, I think that what we're saying eventually then is that like realism as like a content idea is not, uh, it's not simply that something is represented. It comes from some other aspect of it. What's the aspect? Why do we accept the word to mean so successfully these two totally different things? Well, the acceptance of it, I don't know if it necessarily has to do with the definition of it, but I mean, I, I think that we, the, the starting point is looking beyond uh, what, um, what is actually displayed. It's not the, the sayings or the flowers or the, uh, you know, whatever the subject matter happened to be, right? The question next becomes, well, what's, what is the common thread? Like where, aside from, yes, it looks like stuff. Or what, maybe not what is the common thread, but, but what is the infinite possibility of interaction between that incredibly complex thing as it relates to me as an incredibly complex thing, which then results in the work of art? which allows for a really broad range of definitions, right? So you can get Velasquez, you could have, um, you know, Roger van der Weyden, mm. right? So you, you're getting in and it, it becomes then a field of possibilities as opposed to a definition. So not to dwell in the past for too long. Um, I wanna get in our time machine, let's zoom forward and Let's talk about today. Let's go, you know, there's four people up here, you're all making art. Uh, artists, the same way that everybody we just spoke about are making paintings, drawings, sculpture. So what's happening today? Is realism, to, is, is realism happening today? Are you a realist painter? Are you, are you participating in realism? Me? Sure. <laughs> Why not? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Hard carrying. Yeah, absolutely. I'm hard carrying. I'm a, yeah, absolutely. And, I, and I, I, I love the term, and I think I'm particularly participating it in my particular way as, as I understand it. You know, and I think that's, that's the thing. I mean, it, it becomes a kind of a, a confluence of my understanding of those historical events and the possibilities that offers, my engagement with the things that are around me, and then my ability to harness the technique to then express that on a canvas or on a whatever. And oftentimes it's actually changing, but it, it doesn't, it, it's constantly in motion for, for me. Um, so I definitely think, I totally believe that there is such a thing as realism, right? But I don't narrowly define it as, because I think this is just an academic term, the way that definition is. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean it doesn't have validity, but I definitely, absolutely, totally believe that it is a thing. But I do think in the present time that it could be much more vital as, as a movement or as a thing. I think it's constrained itself, right? And so that's where my real interest is, is what do we do with it to allow everybody who manifests it in particular ways within that field to exist now as a vital living artist, right? In the, the soup that is, I always call it like a shit stew, right? That is the art world, <laughs> right? So how do you want to I'm asking the questions here. <laughs> <laughs> how do you unconstrain it? Uh, well, I don't know how to answer how do you unconstrain it. I, I'm going to go back to the original question, sorry, Alex, which is I think in in our contemporary, in this present moment, that actually like, you know, um, <laughs> we, we all like post on Instagram, right? And we're like hashtag realism, hashtag like realist painting. But I actually don't think that, I think that realism and realism like on Instagram, like it, it kind of is the same word as representation. It doesn't actually have any deep philosophical connection to 
to realism of the 19th century and the Ashken school and 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 Manet and and Whist, you know, in that original lineage, I think that today it really just means representation. Um, and I, um, and I, you know, I think we're, we were going to try and like define terms. Um, I'm, I'm not sure. I think that might be outside the scope of this evening's conversation to, to sort of wrangle that. Um, but maybe not, maybe not coming up with terms, but maybe agreeing that there, maybe there needs to be some kind of vocabulary or dialogue or some kind of defining terms for what's happening now. But I think in the current moment of representational painting, there's actually one of the things that's distinct about it is that it is incredibly pluralistic in terms of like the different varieties of, of attitude and, and desire that are, that are all like happening under the um, ages of, of realism. It, it's, you know, I feel like I have a terrible confession to make, which is that the, the, the more I paint, the, I think I'm actually not a realist painter. You know, like um, I'm increasingly interested in, in other things that don't have to do with the origin of, of perceptual painting, of mimesis, of, of, of naturalism, although there's, there's like, you know, ideas about structure and, and realism and light and form and laws of physics and a fidelity to just sort of the beauty and the tradition of of representational painting that I'm incredibly passionate about but um, yeah I'm not I but I don't think I actually am a realist painter yeah, I think that's there's um what Patricia's saying I, I feel like kind of um nods towards something I, I kind of think about realism while I feel like I could be a participant in, in, in how, how whatever kind of uh, shape that, that takes today, I, I don't think it's actually the same um, in that I, I don't yeah. feel like I'm responding to the same kind of phenomenon that was responded to, say, 400 years ago, 500 years ago, whatever it is. Um, I, I mention all the time, probably people are sick of hearing me say this in conversation, but like I grew up playing video games. I grew up playing Street Fighter. That, that was a kind of representation that I was, that I was witnessing. I, don't, I know that Rivera didn't. I know that, that artists in, in the past didn't have these kind of stimuli. And, and while I don't think that like negates uh, my experience as like a realist painter, I do think that it informs it in a way that, that I, I look at the world um, with a set of notions um, that are, I don't want to say more complicated, but they are, they are more fraught in terms of like what constitutes seeing the world and translating the world. Does that make sense? Sure. Yeah, but my question would be, the thing that pushes back yeah. is that the world or is that you right so when you when you when you're defining that and when you're measuring it, it are you measuring against something that is not you right because that go ahead Tell me. i don't understand your question yeah. what, what i'm saying is that so when you take the standard right and all the things even when you think about color light and form right when you think of anything where is that standard taken from is that taken completely from your own machinations in your head, which has no, the question would, or is it somehow taken from something that's not you, right? And that ultimately is the realism, right? Is that something that stands up against you and can declare itself? But I would say it's coming, there's two things I would, that come to my mind. There's the, is a thing that's not you, meaning the world that you're looking at, and then there's whatever art tradition you're uh, engaging in. Both of them are not you. Right. And I think one is the, your culture, and one of, and I think that that's where I really am fascinated, and that's what I'm interested in. And th the idea that we we as individuals look, we're looking out through our eyes at the world, but as cultural participants we're looking out through the matrix of our cultural engagement. And I think re that, that realism is, for me at least, a cultural engagement growing up and as a child seeing the Leonardo drawing and that quality that I just kept seeing here and here and here. And each one of these people is, is in, engaged in, in some ways in one big project, although they're off on little shoots off to the side. Uh, and I, that's, so I do think it's not me, those things aren't me, but I, then I see 
there's the so those are those it's like those artists that I that are outside of me are like an avenue to the world. Right. So that's why I don't preclude. I agree with you, and that's why I don't preclude video games. Oh no, I don't. Either. As a possibility, you know what I'm saying is like it's it's influential in that sense, right? Like I've I've accepted that that is a paradigm of representation, and therefore when I look at my own representation, that uh, that is a fuel that I take. Into it. Right, that? right. But if so, but my point is that if you take 19th century realism, right, yeah. and you have a definition of it, the possibility of the things that don't fall in this is as somewhat of an outsider in the sense that not an outsider in, in putting, but just living outside of is it if you have a definition and then you look at the things and those things that were your experience fall outside of that definition then your experience becomes then precluded from being part of a possible art experience. Okay. See what I'm saying? So when I look at the realist world in general, it is more similar than it is different. In history, it was really different. Sure. But as it's going on now, it's similar. Why? Because it's, it's living according to a definition, which we keep going back to as a time period, right? Whereas actually the realism is the video game, right? It's me living in Talmadge, Ohio, growing up on Gilligan's Island and Hot Pockets, yeah. right? Yeah. And I'm not yeah. gonna paint the gleaners. I've never seen anybody picking up seeds in a field at, as the sun is setting. Yeah. And I love the painting, right? Yeah. And I wanna own it and I love it and I think about it, and I, but it's not me. I grew up with the video games and Gilligan's Island exactly. and you know, high school letter jackets and whatever. And but yeah. interestingly though, we're, yeah. we're coming to that riff in the realism definition, because because neither had Michelangelo, he's not one of our realists, but neither had a northern painter seen the, you know, our, the, the angel Gabriel coming to the, was it Gabriel with the Virgin Mary? Sure. Uh, yeah. uh, he hadn't seen that in the, in the outfits and the castles and the battles, and so he hadn't seen any of those things either. He'd seen something that to him might have seemed equally alien. But you, but you haven't seen your great grandfather, right? Only photographs. So, right. But what I'm saying is, so the idea is that the, the 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 magic that you talked about of realism was that you could cloak it in the particularity of a now to lend legitimacy to this experience you never had. I didn't say that. No, 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 before you said, no, 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 you, you said the magic of what realist painting, so the magic of the, the ability to, to. It's to turn the inert into the, into, into the essence of experience. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. So but the particularity. I, I was thinking more, not the experience I didn't have, I was thinking, although that's not impossible, I was thinking more about an experience that I had of looking at, you know, maybe I came out of, this, these diaphanous marble uh, little cloth on the belly of the Greek lady, it's like, that's so crazy. It's like real, but it's not. It's a bunch of marble, but somehow there was something that felt this artist was compelled to represent their visual, their, their tactile experience through inert material. That's different. Is, I mean, yeah. it's part of, we're, we're circling all of these touching like Venn diagram definitions. That's the one I'm interested in. The political one, I'm, I guess I'm also interested in. But the other one of that super materiality, it, that's also amazing. They're all, I, I think we're, let me ask one more question just because we're not, I think it would be valuable. We're talking about artists out of, I guess, the canon that are realists. Who, what artists aren't realists? That might help us know what we're talking about. I get dicey territory. Well, I mean, you know, who isn't? Because, you might say like Rubens is not really a realist that, as much as we adore, Jimmy, like I adore Rubens, right? But like his like hunting scenes and his like swirling women and like, the, I mean, that is, it's, um, 
it, it, it has beautiful language of realism, but it's incredibly Baroque and fantastical and imaginative. But in a lot of ways, they're super Baroque. But on the other hand, a lot of people would say, yeah, that's probably for those overfed Flemish ladies, a lot more realistic than, <laughs> you know, if you took off their corsets, that's probably what they look like. <laughs> compared to the 100 years earlier live baseball figures yeah. but doesn't but doesn't that bring and, and i think it's uh, okay, doesn't that bring the point when you're looking at contemporary realism right because we're talking about the present yes if there's that range right if you can make that argument across all these different things right which i think you can right is contemporary realism so tied to one idea or two ideas that it doesn't admit for all of those possibilities that the past realism actually offered. I that think I think is, to me, is one of the major problems. Well, for me, I'm just to, forgive me everyone who's heard me before, but just to get on my old, my hobby horse, I think the, what happens is with photography, essentially our understanding of realism has become completely defined by photography. And for most people, if it looks more like a photograph, it's more realistic. And so, even though historically there's going to be a confluence between resemblance to a photograph and what we consider realistic, I think that that has created a, a difficult, it's, it's hard to extract ourselves from that at that point. So I think right now when we think about like the definition of realism, it, for even though we, pretend to be maybe more sophisticated, we're, we're very much, when we use that word about contemporary artists, it's, it's an overwhelming, uh, you know, issue of the, the question of does it look more like a photograph? Mm -hmm. And things that diverge from the photograph are considered less realistic. So in an honest moment, would you say that if you talk about contemporary, would you say that it looks more like a photograph? Yeah, I would say that's what we all understand it to be. But would you say that's what's actually, when you see the canvases that are being produced, do you think that it's actually also now present in the painting? Even artists who aren't working right. using who photographs. Or not using photographs. Are, are, we are so extremely yeah. influenced by, I mean, we have this, uh, we, 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 we assume that, the authenticity of an image is uh, it, its similarity to a photograph is what makes it a more authentic image. I just wanted to ask a question, maybe it's a little bit provocative, but like, I um, is it not among artists at least a little bit of a straw man? Because I don't think anybody on this podium or this whatever we're on would say that like would equate. I don't think your paintings look anything like a photograph. They look a painting to me. Let's say with Patricia and and, and Tommy's nobody. Um, I mean, is there like a legitimate complaint that we that anybody within like the uh, the community of like realist painters is is uh, conflating these things? I think that I think that the photo has profoundly influenced our contemporary sense of form, even amongst realists and representational painters in the atelier. I think that if you look at you know even even just a simple like. Even a, a fervent atelier uh, figurative drawing, you know, drawn, drawn completely from life, right? There's a naturalism, a fidelity to whatever, like pooches, like a sense of proportion, uh, you know, like little pooch, you know, like, you know, the proportion, right? A, and a, an allergy to um, idealistic forms and proportions, and a fidelity to whatever is perceptual yeah, and naturalism. Yeah, and no I doubt. think all like that sense of form has been very influenced by by photography and like you know, the, the graphic revolution, the proliferation of images that has shaped all of our thinking about what the body does look like or what the body should look like. So I think even amongst, you know, very highly trained atelier painters who exclusively work from life, I think that that influence of photography has shaped our sense of form. Isn't it also like it's been shaping it for hundreds of years though? I mean, it's not as if like, since the 1850s. The first one to see photographs. No, uh, since the 1850s, so like, I mean, yeah. I feel like when I look at my paintings and I demand a certain standard of like uh, um, fidelity to the real, 
in them. I'm, I'm referring to what I've seen in painters in past generations more so probably than I would to, I mean, in my own mind. But more I think a lot of us are. But those painters, uh, I mean, there's a generation, a lot of the artists who are coming up now who are whatever, classical oriented traditionalists are looking primarily at artists who were working from photographs which is a fascinating thing i mean like all the artists after 1870 all of the late 19th century artists were were working from photographs right all these people and they 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 were like in this kind of overlap between traditionally trained artists and artists who were operating in a like radically, almost instantly transformed visual world where photography just took the visual, the image world by storm. Mm. And any image that didn't look like a photograph just must have seemed hopelessly old fashioned mm. by the time you get to the 1870s. Mm. Right, I think it's like, it's, it only goes in one direction. Like once you've seen the photograph and once you've seen the naturalism, oh. the apparent naturalism of work that's like done with that, then you look at older work and it just doesn't I don't look think, I don't, realistic. I think culturally broadly, yes. I think individually, right. not necessarily. Individuals have done all sorts of different things. I think the the kind of spasm of, of that first generation of radical modernists in the 1880s had to do with not wanting to do that. Uh, and that's understandable. I think that had a kind of baby bathwater problem, but that that's, you know, that's certainly not a new idea at all. But it, we are still in a kind of reverberating visual culture that you know dealing with that so for us to talk about the nuances of realism in centuries that preceded the 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 image machine uh and then and how we relate to it we have to sort of see there's this like mm. hard line mm -hmm. that changes everything <laughs> and so we we have to navigate it's just we're, we're navigating a new world to try mm -hmm. to do this mm -hmm. in this in our time so how do you and this kind of brings us into the i guess the future a little bit but how do you going forward how do you d discern the difference between if everybody's making paintings that look like things realism realistic and we have a photo sensibility and then there's a, this gallery is filled with paintings that all look like that or something. How, how can someone tell the difference between one or the other? Does it matter? Or is it just this is where we are now and this is how they're going to look because we stare at our phones all day and that's our perception of reality now and, and that's the way it's going to be. Or is it someone who's drawing a figure and maybe the proportions are a little weird because the foreshortening on the hand is in front of them and they just make it bigger to really because their sense of space is so different or they're thinking of space differently than everybody who's thinking of space flat movie screens tvs iphones whatever so when they're all these paintings and drawings are in a gallery how do you how do you differentiate that how do you talk about that how do you, how is one different from the other or are they are they they're just a bunch of paintings that look like stuff I mean, I think the implication is that you need to try to not be like the artists that, you know, I think probably philosophically or just intuitively, it seems like probably it's wiser not to, to, to you know, try to not be like anything. You want to try to be, you want to pursue rather than flee uh, as an artist. Um, and uh, so you have to let other people do what they're doing and hopefully People will judge you for what you are rather than for the extent to which you're not like something else. Right. I mean, that seems like a rather weak answer. But I think I think the what I was describing with those uh, 1880s artists, I feel like they left behind an awful lot of fertile ground in their effort to not be like, you know, photocopying 1880s salon art. <coughs> Uh, and they so I think they, they began this or that wasn't the only reason but they they certainly did launch a kind of series of uh, what to me seems unfortunate uh, avant-garde movements that left behind a relatively 
or tremendously strong art tradition, I think out of the anxi out of anxiety. And so I guess I wouldn't want to do that again. <laughs> yeah, and see, you know, the funny thing is I actually think exactly the opposite. I think their conclusion may not be the conclusion that we all come to, but I think there's incredibly fertile ground in their struggle with that. So, for example, I remember with Kate Lehman and, and Travis Schott, we went through, and I, I just read a book on Cezanne, right? And Cezanne's kind of contempt for the photograph and, and the attempt to have the visual experience and to, to have mark making relate to the visual experience of a thing or a scene or a person, right? And the solution is a solution that diverts incredibly from what a lot of people maybe in this room would find as to be the pleasing solution, right? In some kind of aesthetic terms or whatever. But he's doing a real struggle to have what is actually going on yeah. when a human being looks at a thing and the head moves and the thing changes and what mark are you legitimately allowed to make when you have that experience? Right? Because once you start adjusting that mark, oftentimes the reality is you're adjusting it to meet an aesthetic of a previous art movement. Right? So I'm not saying that the, the solution is to paint like Cezanne. What I'm saying is that in that exploration, it might not have led where any of us want to end up, but it's incredibly fertile. Yeah, it's you know we were ta we were talking earlier about like uh, about like what is the content of realism? How do we tie together these like divergent pictorial scenes? You know, from uh, you know cathedrals and, and religious scenes to just individuals, portraits, flowers, whatever it is. Um, I think in in some ways, like the beginning of the existence of photographs, uh, you know, freed us from the red herring that was uh, it all just looks like stuff, and we can actually look at the content behind the work rather than rather than the, the, the appearance rather of things. Or or even what happens in a visual experience. Yeah, well, precisely, I mean, that, that's in a sense the content under the content. Right. Ultimately, I don't know that I, I care what the artist's like attitude towards realism or those things are. Like ultimately, like when I look at a painting, I I want to get a sense of why does the artist care about this thing that they made for made? What what is it, you know, what is it about their sense of form or their expression? What is it about the artist's sensibility that somehow comes through to me through this medium of painting? That and then how does it relate to what it, that, to my own life? You know, I mean, I think ultimately we we do need you have to have an entry point to a painting, right? Like you have to you have to have some relationship to it to your own life lived experience, and that's I think realism per se is appealing because it it does create this bridge between that artist's lived experience and what they're crafting in her work. And then my lived experience and this like magic happens between those two things. Um, and I, I, I think that's what like going into a gallery and like what distinguishes, you know, work created in this mode or that mode. Like, I don't, I don't have any, you know, I don't, I don't know about any of those things, but I do like when you see something that is made by a talented artist who like they, you just, um, there's just a passion and the sensibility about like why they crafted that thing. And then you care about it too, or you connect it with your own life experience. And it's, it's that, um, it's that passion for, um, for life that somehow communicates to me. So I always feel like conflicted, like looking at Ang in that situation, because like clearly you can't make a painting like his without caring passionately about what you're making. Right. But I, I almost feel zero conveyance of that, that passion. Not that I need like brush strokes to tell me someone's excited, but uh, oh, I mean, like, in, rather in like on and, and yeah, and of course, I, right? just, I mean I'm not wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and we all feel the same thing. Okay. Yep. Wow. Hey, come on. Let's not talk about everything. But I, you know, I have a couple in my mind that I think of, and I, and I think you can't make that without being just lifetime committed in a way that I I respect and love to emulate. However, the conveyance, I mean, I, I, I could easily walk by. It's a complicated, I mean, I'm just saying, I believe a lot of the ideas you have been talking about. You know, I love Ang, and because there's something about the crazy, the, his crazy intensity and the, 
the rigor of his design and the color and that crazy satin, you know, I mean, just the satin alone, like, I, it's just, I'm like, just like, yeah, that's great. I'm totally happy to look at that. But then his people look a little goofy sometimes. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, they do, I mean, but I, you do. know, so I, but there's a charm to that too. But his very tactile and have this beautiful but they express a very cohesive like that is ang's world that is ang's form sense every ang face looks like an ang you know and that is his personality being expressed like through through his work and yeah okay sometimes it's a little funny and a little weird but even those idio 